Heavenly Father, I thank You so much for all that You do in us, all that You have done for us, all that You do through us. I pray this night that You would give wisdom to my words, that You would give wisdom through Your Word, and that we would walk out of here closer in our walk with You than we came in tonight. For that's the only goal we have, Lord. To seek first Your kingdom and to pursue it with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. To be deep in love with You and to walk in faith with You. Use this night to grow us, to challenge us, to disciple us. For it's in Your name that we pray. Amen. All right, it's important that we know the books of the Bible. There's 66 of them. So each Wednesday night, we do a review of those 66. If you're new to the church or you're new to the Bible, I encourage you, go ahead and open up your Bible to the first couple of pages. There's going to be a list of all the books of the Bible in there. And just go through them with us because we do it every week. And pretty soon it'll become old hat for you. I remember a few years ago when I first did this, mine was the only voice I could hear. Now I can hear the whole choir as, as everybody's doing it, and I enjoy that immensely. So let's do the books of the Bible, beginning with Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Ze no, that's, yeah, it is, Zechariah, Malachi. New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, 1st and 2nd Timothy, Titus, Philemon, Hebrews, James, 1st and 2nd Peter, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John, Jude, and Revelation. Sorry about that. My brain went into um, autopilot. I looked back and saw a face and it got me to think their name. And I forgot which name was next in the Bible. I, I, that's one of the reasons I kind of look around while we're doing this, because if I look at my Bible and I see a Bible book, it automatically goes where I'm, and I, squirrel. Anyway. All right. Let's look tonight in the book of Proverbs. If you have your Bible with you, I'd encourage you to open up to Proverbs chapter one. And we're going to look at Proverbs this evening because somebody back there on our questions list, wrote a question that says, would love to have a sermon on Proverbs to teach how to live our lives. That's a pretty good open, open end question. Babe, if you would do me a favor and turn the rheostat for those lights down just a little bit, because when it's on full max, they flicker and it's about to drive me nuts up here. Um, <clears throat> Speaking of which, and forgive my ignorance, I do read a lot, but I don't read everything. Someone wrote a question back there that references the six Old Testament laws on social justice. If that's your question, catch me after church, because I don't know what you're talking about. And I want to be sure that I speak to that issue appropriately. So if you're the one that wrote that question, let me know so I can look at the book that you're looking at to figure out what the six laws that somebody has pulled out because that's not anything anybody taught me in seminary. So I, I need to kind of catch up with where you're at and what you're reading before I can answer that question adequately. All right, but tonight's question is, would love to have a sermon on Proverbs. Great. So I get to do a book study on one evening. And this is a lot of fun because Proverbs is one of my favorite, favorite, favorite of the books. I want to share something with you from my experience because I pray that it becomes your experience. 
when I was a young warthog, uh, probably 13, 14 years old, somebody in the church looked over and said, you need to read the Proverbs every day. And gave me a system that I'll give you in my closing. And I started reading the Proverbs every day. And by the time I was 17, 18 years old, I had people in the church that had been in the church longer than I had been alive that were saying to me, you have a wisdom beyond your years. And I, that always used to catch me off guard. It's how do you answer that when you're 17? It's like, what, what, what do you even mean? But what I have learned in the years since then is that they were exactly right because the wisdom of God in humanity and in life is captured in Proverbs. And if you will spend the time letting that wisdom seep into your brain, it will have an effect on the decisions that you make in life. And so I just wanted to open that up because, I mean, if I were to come in here this evening and say, okay, how many of you would like to have more wisdom? Most hands would go up. I mean, if I ask, you know, how many of you would like to be dumb as a box of rocks? I don't think anybody would admit to that. We want to be wiser. We want to be more knowledgeable. And here is an excellent key that God has given us for just that purpose. Proverbs is one of the five books called the books of poetry. Um, that's because some of the Proverbs, the first nine chapters specifically, are written in Hebrew poetic form rather than the proverb form. The Proverbs are ancient and all the way through the Scriptures. There is not a singular author, and we're going to talk through the authorship a little bit, but some of these have come from a long time ago, and some of them are from the wisest man on earth. Some of you may have read books that very quickly say, well, yeah, the Proverbs were written by Solomon. That is true for about two-thirds of the book. But there's about a third of the book that Solomon had nothing to do with. And it's more ancient and then more recent Proverbs that were added into the book as well. The book of Proverbs in the poetry, that is, as we're going through our Bible books, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon. That five books are the books of poetry. Within that are the books of wisdom. And the books of wisdom are the books of Job, Proverbs, and Ecclesiastes. And so you, you have these books that their intent is to teach wisdom, that teach a way of living with God and interacting with Him. So I've used a word repeatedly already that is all through this book, but I think I need to define it. Knowledge is facts and data that you learn. Knowledge is learned. But wisdom is the proper application of that knowledge to a given situation. Okay? You, you, you probably know someone that fits the moniker of an educated idiot. You, you know what I'm talking about? That guy that's got 14 degrees on the wall but he can't make a decision at a flashing yellow light. He has all the knowledge in the world, but no wisdom. He doesn't have the ability to take all of that knowledge and actually make good choices in the world around him. That ability to take knowledge and create good decisions and applications of that knowledge in a given situation is wisdom. In the raw form, it looks like MacGyver. You know, it looks like the A-Team. Most of you are old enough to remember those shows. You know, these guys with a set of skills would find themselves in a situation and look around and see what stuff they had on hand and begin to jury-rig something together to solve their problem. That's wisdom. 
Wisdom is the ability to sit in a situation and take the knowledge and apply it. And so as we're going to look at Proverbs, we're going to be looking at wisdom. Now, wisdom has a beginning point, and I'm going to let the Bible explain that. But once that beginning point is accessed, then wisdom comes through experience and exposure. The more you learn, the more you apply, the more wisdom you have. And it's, it, it grows exponentially that way. There is an old cliche, and I'm saying it's so old it's in the Bible, um, that in Jeremiah chapter 18 and verse 18, he quotes what was already an old cliche when he wrote it down. And that was that the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise, nor the word from the prophet. This is a maxim that speaks to the idea of as long as you have law, you're going to have priests. As long as you have counsel, you are going to have wise people. And as long as you have the Word of God, you will have prophets. And so, wisdom is available through any and every generation. God did not intend it for an Old Testament audience or a New Testament audience or just the church age. Wisdom is available to everyone. And I will tell you that I know some exceptionally handicapped, dysfunctionally mental people that have a lot more wisdom and they need to be respected for that. Intelligence has nothing to do with wisdom. Education has very little to do with wisdom. You can find the profound and the wise in the most simple people. So I say that as encouragement to each and every one of us that if we seek wisdom, she's available to us. And I say she because that's the way the Bible refers to her. It's funny that the Bible references wisdom. It personifies wisdom as a woman. And I have always appreciated that. So let's look then at the book really briefly. The book opens with a prologue. I love prologues because prologues tell you what's going to happen. Tell you what's already been happening and set you up for success. It's like if you've ever seen the opening to Lord of the Rings movies. There's this great big long prologue that brings you into the story so that even though you're starting in the second and third age, you're already up to what's going on. Well, Proverbs, you know, you're always like, okay, well, so what's this book about? Proverbs just gives you that. So look with me at chapter 1 and verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel. So we have Proverbs. What are the Proverbs for? Well, the next six or five verses. For attaining wisdom and discipline. Oh, don't miss that. Wisdom and discipline are connected. We all want wisdom, but very few of us want the discipline that comes with it. But the reality is, discipline is wisdom. Exercising the discipline to not say something stupid is wisdom. Exercising the discipline to do what you know is right is wisdom. And discipline and wisdom go hand in hand. You cannot have a wise person that is undisciplined. Wisdom and discipline are always connected. So the Proverbs are written down so that we can attain wisdom and discipline for understanding words of insight, for acquiring a disciplined and prudent life. There it is again. Disciplined and prudent 
life. For doing what is right and just and fair. For giving prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise listen and add to their learning and let the discerning get guidance. For understanding proverbs and parables, the sayings and riddles of the wise. So, why do we have a book of Proverbs? Well, Solomon just told you. God wants you to be wise and disciplined and to grow in all areas of your life. That verse 4 and 5 is just a wonderful picture for giving prudence to the simple. I don't care what your IQ is, you can get wiser. I don't care how simple you are, you can become wiser. And you don't have to wait till you grow up because it's knowledge and discretion to the young. We should start Proverbs in the crib. If we're teaching our children wisdom, they will grow in wisdom. And then let the wise, okay, so those of us that are already older and wiser, will let us get older and wiser. We can just keep adding. You think, well, I got it. I mean, any of you think you have all the wisdom that you need? I certainly do not. I still make stupid decisions. And, and I need more wisdom. I need more discretion. I need more prudence. I need more discipline. And so let those that already have wisdom have exercised the wisdom to get more. <laughs> Because only a fool would think this amount of wisdom is enough. Okay. And sometimes the Proverbs are kind of tough. Sometimes the the things don't make sense. And that's the way it ends in verse 6. Why do you read Proverbs? To understand Proverbs. And that's not a circular argument. It's the idea of the more you expose yourself to it, the more you appreciate it and the more you pick it up. Once you start to learn the format, once you start to learn the language, once you start to learn how these things are being presented, and you get those stuck in your head, and then suddenly you find yourself in a situation and a proverb will come to mind. It's fascinating to me how many times in my youth I had these proverbs in my head that didn't make any sense to somebody with the life experience of a 16-year-old. But five, six, ten years later, I run into the situation that that proverb was talking to and it's already in here. And it's like, oh, that's what that was talking about. Now I get it. And now I've got the wisdom to apply to that situation. All right, so we get to verse 7. The end of our prologue. And we get in this discourse the origin for wisdom. If you want wisdom, and I think all of us would raise our hands, here's where you have to start. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But fools despise wisdom and discipline. Don't miss what this verse just said. You're not going to get wise in your Philosophy 101 class. You're not going to get wise in your Philosophy 203 class either. Or your 4 class, or your 500 class, or your 1000s class. Wisdom comes from God. Now because God is good and He's given us a planet where we get to interact with other people, it is possible that I'm going to get some of the wisdom of somebody else that rubs off on me so that I start to look wise. But if I don't have a relationship with God, what I got was lucky, not wisdom. Okay, Because wisdom comes from God. So if you want wisdom, that's where you have to start. So this prologue starts us off in this book. And then it picks up and chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4 are all this idea of the cry of wisdom, the value of wisdom, and letting wisdom first and foremost keep you away from an enticement to sin. Okay? 
there's a good place to start. How many of you would like to start sinning less? Well, what you need is the wisdom to avoid the enticement to sin, and that comes from a relationship with God. So it starts with God, and then you gain the wisdom, and that helps you to, to, to avoid the enticement of sin. So that's the first four chapters. Then we get into chapter 5. And, and this area, I would even talk about these first nine chapters in terms of wisdom and its opponents. Okay? There are things that stand against wisdom. First is sin. And then more specifically in chapter 5, it speaks to the idea of adultery. <laughs> Ultimately not wise. Okay? And then it speaks to the idea of folly. Now the Bible speaks in terms of fools and folly. Folly is the silly things unwise people do. And unwise people are fools because fools do folly. Okay, So when you're reading in the Bible and you read about the idea of a fool, it is someone who is ultimately unwise. A fool does things that are not wise. Think about back in the uh, 17, 1800, 1600s, 1500s, you know, back when we had kings and they always had a jester in their court and a lot of times the jester was called a fool because the king is doing wise things all day long and he just wanted some jokester to come in and lighten the mood. But what was the guy doing? Absolute, inane, stupid stuff. Had no value. It's kind of like the TV. You know, the king's had a jester, we have cable. I, I don't know. So, as you look through here, you get this idea about, okay, we're going to do this compare and contrast with wisdom and with adultery, with wisdom and folly. And, and then we get into chapter 7, and he goes back to the idea of the adulteress. Okay, if adultery is a bad thing, the individual enticing you into adultery is another bad thing. Never forget, and this is just one of those things, that this is where reading the Bible over and over and over, you start to make those connections in the, in, in the constellations. You start to see the verses come together. Solomon. Who's his mama? Bathsheba. Y'all remember the story of David and Bathsheba? A story of a king's adultery? Don't think Solomon didn't have something to say about his own parents' lifestyle. Hello? He was raised in that house. And he gained some wisdom being the child of David and Bathsheba. And so he speaks about our sexuality constantly. As you're going through Proverbs, there's a lot in there about this sin and how it just defies wisdom. It is one of the ultimate foolishness. It is the folly of thinking that something over there is better than what I have here and nurturing that instead of nurturing that. The grass is always greener where you water it. It's not greener on either side of the fence. If you want the relationship with your spouse that you want, nurture that relationship. Don't go looking for a replacement. But that's Proverbs, helping us to see that and understand that. And we get into chapter 8, and we get wisdom again calling out and drawing us to and giving us the value and telling us all about wisdom and how we should pursue wisdom. And again, this is written by Solomon to a child. We don't know if it was a young child, a teen, or who, but he, he's basically the wisest man in the world trying to teach his child how to grow up to be wise. And so he starts with this prologue of these nine chapters. And then you get a really good... Chapter 9 is just this phenomenal uh, compare and contrast 
between wisdom and folly. This is what wisdom looks like. This is what folly looks like. This is what wise people look like. This is what fools look like. And it, it really gets into the weeds in that chapter. And then we hit the Proverbs of Solomon. And the Proverbs of Solomon are just that. He starts to write in these short sentences that give some insight. Uh, these go from chapter 10 through chapter 29. So there's a lot of these. You know, that's why I said that two-thirds of Proverbs is written by Solomon. Okay, But he's not the only author. Because when we get to the end of our 10 through 29, but there's a, an excerpt in the middle. Um, in chapters 22, verse 17, through chapter 24, verse 34, there is another collection of wisdom, and it's called the sayings of the wise. Now, the sayings of the wise are those proverbs that existed before Solomon showed up. These are earlier. These are the ancient wisdoms. And then in chapters 25, 1 through 29, 27, you run into another bank of Solomon's wisdom, but they're not from the Proverbs of the Solomon of before, these were actually another book of Solomon's Proverbs that were captured by King Hezekiah. Years later, Hezekiah, trying to be one of the righteous kings, compiled some of Solomon's Proverbs for himself. And so what these chapters are is that somebody took that group of Proverbs and stuck them in right here. Okay, And then you get chapter 30 is the sayings of Agor. Now, I would love to tell you the story of Agor. Unfortunately, no one can. It's the only place in the Bible his name shows up. We don't know who he was. We don't know where he was. We don't know when he was. And the same is true when we get to chapter 31. There's a king that shows up. King Lemuel, again, we have no idea who he was, when he was, or where he was. But we have some of his wisdom and Proverbs tucked in here as well. And then we get an epilogue. I always enjoyed stories that had the epilogue. It's like the Paul Harvey thing. It's the rest of the story. It's the, it's, it's the aside of the author after the story is told to just kind of tie up any loose ends. Well, in Proverbs, the epilogue is a commentary on the wife of noble character. And I know that this is one of those passages that causes a lot of women a lot of grief, and I do not understand why. I think it has to do with the whole better homes and gardens and vogue and all of that junk women read that makes them feel like they're inadequate compared to the neighbor. And so you come to this and it's like, oh, yet another thing I can't measure up to. When that is not at all what's being taught here. Remember, this is in the book of the poetry. It's emotive. It is aspirational. It's in the books of wisdom. So it is trying to teach what a girl should look like. Because you have to remember that in the culture of this day, the young men would go to school. The young women would get taught at the home how to run a home. The young men were writing the Scripture and reading the Proverbs. And if sister was lucky... Brother read out loud, so she got to hear him once in a while. The only time a woman got to hear what was in the scrolls was when they were in synagogue. The boys got to go to synagogue every day of the week while they were children and learn, but the girls didn't. And so how is the girl supposed to pick up the wisdom of womanhood? Well, she got it from home, obviously, as her mother and grandmother and aunts and cousins were all working around the house, they would teach her how to do the things that she needed and how to come to life. And what this is doing in verses 10 through 31 of chapter 31 
I was looking at this woman. Here's the ideal woman. Here is the woman that you want to grow up to be. It is not a standard that tells you how horrid you are. It is, this is, this is what a wise woman looks like. This is, a, she takes care of her family. She takes care of her finances. She takes care of her husband. She takes care of her children. She takes care of the things around her. She is independent. She is self-reliant. She is taking care of business in a way that takes care of those around her. It's fascinating to me that the Bible gives her 21 verses where it spends the rest of its time bashing on us bubble-headed men. Again, wisdom is displayed as a woman. But let's, let's continue our study tonight. So what are the Proverbs? Well, the Proverbs are a succinct and persuasive saying proven true by experience. Okay? It's just a short sentence that you read it and you go, Oh yeah, that's true. If you've got the experience to get that. If you don't, then you go, really? And then you run into that and you go, oh, that is true. It's this succinct idea given in a short persuasive saying proven true by experience. And another definition is that it is timeless truths or basic values Proven by a previous generation. <laughs> you ever show up to a function for the very first time and you have absolutely no idea what to do or how to do it? I mean, I love how many stories I have heard over the years of men and women two years into their marriage calling back to their parents going, how do you do this? You know, because mom and dad always did it. And you have no idea how to get it. How, how do you stuff a turkey? It always cracks me up, you know. <laughs> She's calling home going, how do you stuff a turkey? She doesn't know that he's off in the other room calling home going, how do you cut a turkey? Because mom and dad always did it. I need your wisdom to teach me. Proverbs. Proverbs is this book of the wisdom of how to live life as we move forward. A third definition, and probably the simplest, it's simply general principles of life. That's what a proverb is. But if I'm going to speak to what a proverb is, I also want to speak to what a proverb is not. And some of you are going to get your head hurt right here, and it's about time. Proverbs are not promises. Proverbs are not guarantees. There are a whole lot of heartbroken men and women out there who want to take, raise a child in the way he should go, and when he's old he won't depart from it, as some sort of a promise from God. Sorry, that verse is in the Proverbs. That verse says, if you do your best your kid has a better chance of coming out right. But at the end of the day, they get to make their own vote. And maybe they'll come back to wisdom and maybe they won't. And that doesn't speak to your parenting if you raise them in the way they were supposed to go. Proverbs are not promises. They are general truths. They are whitewashed, big brush Hey, this is true in the vast majority of the time. Are there times that prove to be exceptions to the rule? Absolutely. You know, cars stay between the mustard and the mayonnaise. And when they don't, you have an accident. Wisdom is you keep your car between that yellow line and the white line. So you need to understand that these are guidelines. They are truths that are most often proven true, but they are not promises or guarantees. Neither are they commands. There's not a single thing in here that says thou shalt. 
their guidance. If you live this way, you will demonstrate wisdom. You will grow in wisdom. Life will go better for you. That doesn't mean life is going to be rosy. That doesn't mean you're not going to have troubles, trials, and tribulations. It means when those things come, your wisdom will keep you from making a stupid decision that makes it worse. Wisdom is not a commandment. It's a guidance. It's a general rule. You know, if you drop that on your toe, it's going to hurt. That, that's a proverb. You know? Well, what are you talking about that? What if I have a feather in my hand? If I drop a feather on my toe, will it hurt? Well, no, it's a feather. You see what I'm saying? So don't take the Proverbs as more than what they are. They are simply the way to wisdom. They are guidance to help us in our decisions. Okay, I want to just spend a little bit of time in closing with some of my favorite, favorite Proverbs, simply because they make me giggle. And to kind of prove the point of everything I've, I've said so far, I want you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 26. This was my favorite. When I first tripped into this in my teens, I just was like, what? I don't get it. And I went running to my pastor. And dear Dr. Granzi, he was so good. He looked at me and he said, go live with it. I was like, that's not an answer. He said, you're right. Go live with it. And I lived with it for about eight weeks. And I came back to him one Sunday morning and went, I got it. He's like, okay, what'd you get? And I told him. And he was like, yep. Because you don't gain wisdom because somebody hands it to you. You gain wisdom by living with it because it is that gained by exposure and experience. So if you're going to read the Proverbs, you have to read them differently then you read other writings. And I'll unpack that in a few minutes. But chapter 26 of Proverbs, join me in verses 4 and 5. Let's look at them independently. First of all is verse 4. Do not answer a fool according to his folly, or you will be like him yourself. Have you ever gotten into an argument with a stupid person? And pretty soon, you can't believe the stupid stuff coming out of your mouth. You digress to their level of intelligence or lack thereof. That's this proverb. Don't answer a fool according to his folly, or you will be like him yourself. Verse 5. Answer a fool according to his folly, or he will be wise in his own eyes. Wait a minute. You just said don't do it. And the very next verse says do it. I didn't have the words back when I was talking to Louia, but it was the idea of situational awareness. you got to know when to answer a fool and how to answer a fool. Sometimes you go down the rabbit hole with them, and sometimes you don't. Sometimes you answer them according to their folly to break the stupidity in their own thinking. Sometimes you don't go there because you recognize this person has so bought into that conspiracy theory, there is no proof on the planet that's going to change their mind. That's wisdom. It doesn't say, well, what should I say to this person? It's not in there. That's for you and your experience and your relationship with that person. But if they're acting the fool, you now have a choice in front of you. Wisdom can answer that two ways. You answer him so that he doesn't think he's right. He's wise in his own eyes. It... I deal with a lot of conspiracy theorists. And... and You will give a counter example and they will go, see, told you. Wait, 
I just argued what you said. No, you completely agreed with me, and here's why. He's wise in his own eye. I'm not getting anywhere with this guy. But I need to answer him to try to break that in a certain situation. Or I need to recognize, nope, that ship has already sailed. I can't even throw a rope over the bow on this one. It's just done. Wisdom is knowing when to engage and when not to engage. And wisdom is knowing why to engage. And that's totally encapsulated in two verses. Welcome to Proverbs. Here's another one of my absolute favorites. Uh, same chapter, chapter 26. Down at... That's not right. Where'd it go? 17, sorry. Sorry, I went to 27 and it's 17. 26, 17. The, the, first time I, the first time I read this one, I was in my bedroom and I fell off my bed laughing. Because I got the picture immediately. Like one who seizes a dog by the ears is a passerby who meddles in a quarrel not his own. I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but in biblical times, they didn't have pets. Dogs were the ones today you would back into your house, close the door, and call the city to come take away. They were diseased. They were mean. They were looking for whatever they could get. If you read anything in the Bible that's referencing a dog, I do not want you to think fluffy at home. Dog in the Bible is pejorative. Think mangy, stray, in your trash can. Now imagine yourself gleefully and blissfully walking up and grabbing said dog by the ears and picking him up. Unless you don't know dog anatomy, let me help you with this. When you grab the ears, you're on the teeth end of the dog. And you are going to get tore up. I always love the scene out of Jungle Book where Baloo's got Shere Khan by the tail and everybody's going, let go, let go, let go, and he answers back, I can't, there's teeth at the other end. <laughs> okay? So you're going to walk up and grab a stray dog you don't know by the ears and try to pick him up. Y you get the mental picture here? Not going to go well for you. What's the corollary? Like that is someone who walks into a conversation and jumps into it. Who starts to meddle in affairs not their own. You really want to get something kicked out of you? Come between two brothers that are in the middle of a fight. Are they your brothers? Are they your kids? Back off and watch the show. You get in the middle of that, you're just going to get hurt. Because they'll both stomp you for getting in the middle of their stuff. It's just like grabbing a dog by the ears. I also get a humor out of this because I'm a historian. <laughs> and I remember we used to have a president that picked up his dog by the ears. and I always got that mental picture in my mind as well. All right. One last one. Back to Proverbs chapter 17. And this one is because it has history. Chapter 17 of Proverbs in verse 28. Proverbs 17, 28. Even a fool is thought wise if he keeps silent and discerning if he holds his tongue. You may not recognize it, but there is an attribution to Lincoln for a comment that is a quote of this proverb. Supposedly, he said, it's better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and prove it. 
It's this proverb. Even a fool looks wise when they keep their mouth shut. What's the lesson? You don't have to have an opinion. You don't have to say what you're thinking. You don't have to interject something in a conversation. A wise person is listening more than they're speaking. Hmm. By the way, it is largely debunked that that quote is attributed to Lincoln because it was not attributed to Lincoln until a children's book in 1931. And there is actually a reference to that quote in a book called Mrs. Goose and Her Book by Maurice Schweitzer that was written in 1907. So could he have said it? Yes. But it wasn't attributed to him until 60, almost 70 years after his presidency. So we don't know who was the first person that actually said that. But whoever it is that said, better to remain silent and be thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt, um, is actually quoting the Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 28 with a little different wording. So how do I apply this to life? I think I've already given you an approach to Proverbs, but I want to tell you how to actually bring it into your daily Bible study. And yes, I did say that. Daily. You don't get wisdom once a week unless you want once a week wisdom. You want everyday wisdom, then you need to saturate yourself with wisdom every day. And isn't it convenient that the guys that put the Bible together actually divided the Proverbs into 31 chapters. So I don't care what the date you start reading the Proverbs is. Start on today's date. So this is the fourth. Go to chapter 4 and read chapter 4. And on the fifth, read chapter 5. And on the 6th, read chapter 6. And on the 31st, read chapter 31. Wait a minute, this month only has 28. Then start back over with one tomorrow. That's what I did from 14 to 17 and beyond. Is I would read one chapter of the Proverbs every day. When I first started doing it, I did it wrong. And so I want to tell you how to do it right. Slow down. You do not get wisdom in chicken nuggets. Okay? You don't get it in picking the thing up and going, nibble, 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 nibble. Have you ever noticed that the 47th piece of popcorn tastes just like the first piece of popcorn? The Proverbs aren't popcorn. The Proverbs are jelly belly jelly beans. Every one of them is a different flavor. You grab a handful of jelly bellies and throw it in your mouth, your stomach will probably throw it right back out of your face. Because you don't need that many flavors at once. You can't read the Proverbs quickly. You take one jelly belly out and you put it in your mouth and you enjoy the flavor and you chew it up and you suck on it and you get all the nectar out of it and then you sit there with your tongue and clean the chunks out of your teeth. And when your mouth is clear, you pick up the next one. You take the time to meditate on it. You take the time to think, what is this thing trying to share with me? What truth is in this? Well, how, do, how would I possibly apply this? Where does this fit in my life? And like I said, when I was young, I just read it. 
I just read it like I would anything else. And I got some things that stuck by accident and the grace of the Holy Spirit. But as I've matured in my faith and in my walk, I come to these now and read them and ponder them and think about them and identify times in my life where, yeah, that's actually proven true and identify points in my life that's like, yeah, but that was an anomaly because that one went way sideways. There's got to be another piece of wisdom out there to help me with that situation because I applied that one there and it went totally sideways. Hmm. So what can I continue to learn? So what can I continue to apply so that I grow in wisdom? It's not about the knowledge. I can sit here and quote the Proverbs all day long, and all I will be is an educated idiot. I'll have the knowledge, but I won't have the wisdom until I begin to apply it into myself. And I won't gain either the knowledge or the wisdom until I begin with God. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So slow down. Don't just skim and go. I mean, you can, but it's like driving through a puddle. You know, you're going to get a little splash on you, but it's not going to stick much. You know, slow down. Lay down in that puddle. Wallow around a little bit. Get your clothes soaked. Stay there a minute. L let it seep in. Let get, go get you some of that. And then, like I said, just go back and do it. 31 days, 31 Proverbs. Every single month, you can read through the book of Proverbs. They're really not that long. They're 20 and 30 and 35. You know, folks are like, how in the world do you spend an hour in Bible study? Well, if I spend a minute each on 35 verses, I've already killed 35 minutes, and now all I've got to do is pray. And if I just prayed for every need on the prayer list, that's going to take 20 minutes. It doesn't take long to fill an hour at all when you start doing it. And if I'm starting to try to do the whole read through the Bible where I'm going to try to read four chapters a day and then I add a proverb on top of that? I'm like, Pastor, how in the world do you expect me? Do you know what my schedule is? I, I, I don't have 10 minutes to read the Bible, much less an hour. Yeah, and your life looks like it. You want the peace that comes from a relationship with God? Try having a relationship with God. He's not Burger King. You don't get it your way. He's not fast food. There is not a microwave in God's kitchen. Slow down. Take the time. Engage the Word. And let the Holy Spirit smack you around where you need it. Because we all do. You're not going to get any better until you get real with God. You need to have a relationship with God. And relationships take time. They take energy. So, give yourself the time. I know a lot of you that get up and you'll spend 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 minutes in a weight room Good. Your body needs that too. So does your spiritual body. I'm going to go to meddling here, guys. I know a lot of biblically educated spiritual idiots. I know a whole lot of people who can quote Scripture out their ears and finish every sentence you start, and their life has no fruit. Their life has no peace. And the decisions that they are making are ungodly and are only bringing more destruction to their homes. I don't want you to be that example. So I'm not asking for the unrealistic. I'm asking for what is actually real. Because at the end of your life, where you spent your energy 
and all the junk you have piled up around your ankles won't matter. The only thing that mattered when you took your first breath is the only thing that will matter when you take your last one. And that is your relationship with Jesus Christ. Your work really isn't that important. How many of you are still in the first job you ever took? Oh, but you couldn't lose that job. You know what? We make time for our movies. We make time for our music. We make time for our meals. We make time for everything else in our relationships. Do we make time for God? Or do we keep Him in a box with a glass in front of it that says, you know, break in place of emergencies? If the only time God is in your life is the emergencies, I bet you have a lot of emergencies. If you'd have more God in your life, you'd have less emergencies. Not that life gets easier. It just isn't an emergency anymore. Oh my God, the power went out. Welcome Genesis 3. We didn't even have power until two, three hundred years ago. And we make a whole lot of stuff important that really isn't. Okay, my encouragement to you, and, and I thank you, whoever, for the question. How do we actually apply some of this stuff to live our lives? The beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. And I have a whole lot of people who try to clean that word up because they really don't want to try to preach a gospel with a God that you're supposed to fear. But let me tell you, the Bible is clear all the way through it. Fear of the Lord means you actually care about Him more than the fear of the boss or the fear of the cop or the fear of the spouse or the fear of unemployment or the fear or the fear or the fear or the fear. When you give God the place that He deserves, it demonstrates that you're more concerned about His opinion than it is or about anybody else's or anything else's, including your own. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Because there is no wisdom outside of God. There is this worldly thing called wisdom, and it gets us politicians like we've got. It gets us a world that is absolutely playing out counseling centers. No, don't misunderstand me. I'm a counselor. I love counseling. But if you can't make it to your life without a counseling session, there's a lot of stuff broke in your life. I was going to save this for another lecture, but I'm going to throw it in now and then. So here it is. Guilt is what I feel. Shame is what others make me feel. Guilt and shame are not bad. They are the consequence of sin. And the only thing counseling can do is help you ameliorate your shame and your guilt. It takes the cross of Christ to fix your problem because you don't have a counseling need. You have a sin problem. And when you understand that and you start approaching your sin problem then you find out that there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus and the guilt is taken away because Jesus has already made you a new creation. And the counseling can help me to understand that, but only if I go to a counselor who actually understands there's a sin problem. And the problem is most of our counselors out there only want to pretend that there's a guilt and a shame problem. There's a whole book out there called the DSM-5 that's all about how do we ameliorate shame and guilt. Well, i got an answer for them. It's right here. It's called sin. You deal with a sin problem and it takes care of the shame and the guilt problems. And there's only one way you do that and that's with a relationship with God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. I told you I was going to start meddling. Heavenly Father, I thank You for this night. 
And I thank You for the book of the Proverbs that gives us wisdom. I pray, Lord, that You would help us to exercise that wisdom. And the first wisdom is to be sure that our hearts are right with You. There are a whole lot of answers that are given by a whole lot of people out there. And it would look like wisdom. Except for Your truth. And Lord, I pray that You would open blinded eyes. That You would open closed and wounded hearts. That You would use Your Gospel and us as Your ambassadors to bring health, to bring restoration, to bring healing. Lord, I pray that You would use this book in the lives of these who hear this Word tonight to change hearts. Lord, we are a people who can make a mess. We can take a perfectly good situation and find a way to mess it up. I have joked for years that I can tear up an I-beam with a rubber chicken. And there's no lie to that. I can find a way to mess something up. And it would all seem like wisdom from a perspective. Thank You for the Proverbs that teach us the principles of truth, the principles of wisdom, that help us to actually live in a way that is different than what this world teaches. The world is trapped in entropy and self-destruction. And Your Word is the only thing that brings hope. I pray, Lord God, that You would help us to see that hope, find that hope, bring that hope in as water out of a glass. That every cell in our bodies might be infatuated, empowered. That Your Spirit would fill us as we yield to You. Lord, I thank You for this Word tonight. And I pray that its application brings us wisdom through Christ our Lord. Amen.